Okay, this is Luke Johnson from Noetic, and we are graced by Clifford Brooks III. He is going to be teaching us a poem today, and I'm going to hand the show over to him. Thanks, Luke. Today, we're going to talk about lyricism and the musical quality of poetry. One of my favorite poets is Rilke. One of my favorite Greek myths is the tale of Orpheus and Eurydice. So, on this first broadcast with Noetic, I thought that I would take my personal passion for poetry and its musical qualities and the ability to tell a story in a way that people understand what you're talking about poetically, symbolically, free of cryptic static or otherwise unproductive tools that do more to mask the poet being not a very good master at his craft taking away from the poem itself. So what I'd like to do first is to read Rilke's Orpheus, Eurydice, Hermes. The myth itself takes place in ancient times when there's a saying that the gods don't suffer man to be happy for too long. Orpheus and Eurydice, Orpheus was a rock star of his day, so to speak. He played a lute, which today we would have as a lead electric guitar, and a beautiful voice, a talent uh, beyond what any man would possess. And he fell deeply in love with a young lady named Eurydice. And Eurydice was, of course, free-spirited and innocent and loved, extremely beautiful and fell just as deeply in love with Orpheus. And the two were noticed by the gods one day, just entirely too happy. And in some of the tellings, a satyr found Eurydice in the woods and chased her into a pit of asps where she died. And there are different versions of this, of all of which get to the point of Eurydice meeting an untimely death before what seemed to be the universe pitted against Orpheus and his love. And that's the first and most poignant lesson and in, in, in underpinning of this story is that things happen to so many of us that seem to come out of nowhere for no reason. And it's not a bad case of paranoia when I've heard it across the board. People agree that when things get really, really good, you start to throw that extra glance over your shoulder or get a little more sleepless at night, wondering, trying to, if you had assessed everything, because surely it's going to come out of left field and all be taken from you, whether you're talking about the book of Job or Orpheus losing his love, leading to another, I guess, another end that every man who's lost something would love to do, and woman. In this case, where Hades has snatched Eurydice away from Orpheus, Orpheus plays his guitar, his lute, and literally sings his way into hell. And... It's the heroic ideal of, you know, don't and they will never take you so far away, I can't find you. And he goes all the way into hell and finds Hades there with Persephone, who Hades has punked in with them with the pomegranate to spend six months under and six months up here. And Orpheus, again, being kind of the politician, looks at Persephone and kind of woos her. Well, baby, look, this ain't fair because Hades doesn't care. Hades doesn't, you know, he doesn't, he's Hades, man. Like, whatever, dude, she's dead. I got her. You know, what you want? And then Persephone's like, baby. Baby, look, I'm stuck here. You tricked me. You could do me this favor. And so Hades, again, being the devil, here again, another lesson. How easy is it to trust something that seems a little shady? It's not very. So Hades says, Eurydice, come here, baby. And Eurydice walks out, and she's dead. She's a shade. She doesn't you know, recognize Orpheus. She doesn't know where she is. She doesn't know what time it is. And Orpheus, of course, is immediately just taken. And uh, Hades says, all right, look, man, I'll let you take her. I'll let you take her, but there's one little catch. You know, Orpheus is like, damn it, of course. Well, Orpheus says, Orpheus says, what, what, well, anything, what, tell me. He says, well, you can have her, but you've got to walk in front, and she's got to walk behind you. And not at one point, no matter how bad you want to, no matter how it eats at you, you can't turn around. Don't you turn around. You turn around, and she's gone. She's mine. So here it again is, is trusting the universe once you've been hurt. In that long trek, Orpheus made out. And all he can hear is his footsteps. And all you want to do is turn around. He would talk to himself to see if she'd talk back, but nobody ever did. And just like human nature, as soon as they see daylight, Orpheus thinks they're far enough and spins around one second too soon to see that she was behind him and to see her sucked back down into the abyss. Hmm. So it's not a very cheery tale, but it kind of fits the mood um, the world has right now, too, as far as what's on the horizon. What are you willing to do? How strong is love? And these are all themes that are as poignant and, and worthy of assessment. 
as they've ever been. So I'll start by reading the poem, Orpheus, Eurydice, Hermes. That was the deep, uncanny mine of souls. Like veins of silver ore, they silently moved through its massive darkness. Blood welled up among the roots on its way to the world of men. And in the dark, it looked as hard as stone. Nothing else was red. There were cliffs there and forests made of mist. There were bridges spanning the void and that great gray blind lake which hung above its distant bottom like the sky on a rainy day above a landscape. And through the gentle unresisting meadows one pale path unrolled like a strip of cotton. Down this path they were coming. In front, the slender man in the blue cloak, mute, impatient, looking straight ahead. In large, greedy, unchewed bites, his walk devoured the path. His hands hung at his sides, tight and heavy. Out of the falling folds, no longer conscious of the delicate lyre, which had grown into his left arm, like a slip of roses grafted onto an olive tree. His senses felt as though they were split in two. His sight would race ahead of him like a dog, stop, come back, then rushing off again, would stand impatient at the path's next turn. But his hearing, like an odor, stayed behind. Sometimes it seemed to him as though it reached back to the footsteps of those other two who were to follow him up the long path home. But then, once more, it was just his own steps echo, or the wind inside of his cloak that made the sound. He said to himself, they had to be behind him. Said it aloud and heard it fade away. They had to be behind him, but their steps were ominously soft. If only he could turn around just once, but looking back would ruin this entire work. So near completion. Then he could not fail to see them. Those other two who followed him so softly. The God of speed and distant messages, a traveler's hood above his shining eye, his slender staff held out in front of him, and little wings fluttering at his ankles. And on his left arm, barely touching it, she. A woman so loved that from one liar there came more lament than from all lamenting women. That a whole world of lament arose in which all nature reappeared, forest and valley, road and village, field and stream and animal. And that around this lament world, even as around the other earth, a sun revolved and a silent star-filled heaven, a lament heaven with its own disfigured stars. So greatly was she loved. But now she walked beside the graceful God, her steps constricted by the trailing grave clothes, uncertain, gentle, and without impatience. She was deep within herself, like a woman heavy with child, and did not see the man in front or the path ascending steeply into life. Deep within herself, being dead filled her beyond fulfillment, like a fruit suffused with its own mystery and sweetness. She was filled with her vast death, which was so new. She could not understand that it had happened. She had come into a new virginity and was untouchable. Her sex had closed like a young flower at nightfall and her hands had grown so unused to marriage 
that the God's infinitely gentle touch of guidance hurt her like an undesired kiss. She was no longer that woman with blue eyes who once had echoed through the poet's songs, no longer the wide couches scent and island, and that man's property no longer. She was already loosened like long hair, poured out like fallen rain, shared like a limitless supply. She was already root. And when abruptly the God put out his hand to stop her, saying, with sorrow in his voice, he has turned around. She could not understand and softly answered, who? Far away, dark before the shining exit gates. Someone or other stood whose features were unrecognizable. He stood and saw how on the strip of road among the meadows with a mournful look, the God of messages silently turned to follow the small figure already walking back along the path. Her steps constricted by the trailing grave clothes. Uncertain, gentle, and without impatience. It's a heartbreaking story, obviously, but it's one that really wrenches at the same places that joy sprang from. Uh, the, to me, again, in the entire poem, it really, Rilke's use of language, and again, the translator of this, Stephen Mitchell, does a beautiful job of conveying the imagery and keeping the spirit and soul alive in this piece. Where in this version, Orpheus and Eurydice are walking out, Orpheus in front, Eurydice is being escorted, so to speak, by Hermes. Again, we all know him as the messenger of the gods who had the shoes with the, with the wings on it. Mercury being another one of his names is walking behind and they really give him, you know, the Greeks were the first to make their gods look like men and be fallible and the men and women and have the same, um, if not more propensity to do uh, wrongdoings. In this same vein, I love, and I've actually had put that aside or forgotten it altogether, was where they talk about how, Her how Hermes or Mercury, when he turns to Eurydice to let her down, that Orpheus had turned around too soon to see her, he said it with pain in his heart. You know, you don't see that kind of connection and, and that, that, that empathy from many gods and or that kind of moment in the poem. And it really goes, I think, of one of the ideas or one of the themes that um, divinity is not ambivalent. It's not ambiguous, but things happen and we don't understand them. But it, it gives the idea in a very subtle ripple that perhaps the universe aches with us, that it doesn't want to punish us or rip from us. There's just a mystery there. That mystery is really open from the beginning of the poem. That was the deep, uncanny mine of souls. And this is the idea of, of the underworld, Hades, not hell as we see it really in, in the Christian faith. We're talking about a time where it was just a, a land of shades. It wasn't the screaming torture and hellfire and brimstone that we see in, in, our, in the Judeo-Christian idea of it. But still not a very joyous, festive joint to be in. Um, how dark it was, how colorless, other than the blood from the dead seeping back up through the walls to reach life again in mankind, which kind of tips the hat to reincarnation. And, and uh, it, it may be an indirect slight way, but it's like, like it's something that I took from it, that everything in it that was alive was moving back upward. And that which stayed behind, which nostalgic people can, to have nostalgia is cool, but we all know that person that you bump into, and I'm 41 years old, and when they say, man, you remember in 10th grade? No, I don't. <laughs> the person that's always living, they always look kind of gray. They're always living back there. You know, again, and that's kind of one of the, again, not being judgmental, but just kind of an image that it brings to me. And then into hell, across the lakes that hang like mist, bridges that span the void. You can see these rickety, the ones in like Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, where you know, you'd fall over and get eaten by alligators. You see this very bleak, very stark, very quiet landscape, the distant bottom like the sky on a rainy day above a landscape where real K then balances what he sees in the underworld is something we might have seen in this real world to again, create that imagery. And through the gentle unresisting meadows, 
one pale path unrolled like a strip of cotton. The first two stanzas kind of bring us in on this movie. I always see like a movie type landscape and then zooms in and zooms in and zooms in and zooms into in one trail that's kind of flitting out in front of these three that are walking. And that's where the poem opens up. It doesn't say Orpheus and Eurydice were in love and this is what happened. It's after your, Orpheus has already gone into Hades to get Eurydice and it picks up as they're walking out. So it's a very different way to tell the story that really I kind of, it insists upon the reader to do some homework, which I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to, but you just don't want to use so many thesaurus-esque words that it leaves the reader going, this is nonsense. Not, you know, I mean, it's, when the big word fits and it's the only one for it, please do. But to oh. insist upon it is just obnoxious. And it sounds just as annoying on page as it does in, 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 uh, in conversation. And typically when it's used for the latter, um, you can tell because the word's not used quite right. You know, um, you don't see any of that here. There's really not any words here, but it's going to insist that you go back and read the beginning. And it really makes you want to. It's so emotionally packed, but so well written that it was really one of those things that I knew of the story. But when I came across this in college, it made me go back and read it anew and read it You know, years after I'd read it the first time, seeing it from a, a more mature angle. And it, really, that's why it's hung on to me. And in my new in my next book, I think it departs. I actually have a twist on it as well. Um, and it's, just, it's a story that we all understand. Anybody that's been in love, anybody that's lost, um, these things that you know people sometimes becomes trite. We talk about it so much, but when you see so much tragedy in the world, when they're when you have your loved ones ripped from you, when in, in something that seems so senseless, that's really one of the main, most heartbreaking themes in the poem is that there are things that happen that seem tragic, and we're so angry, we're so mad that we've lost it because it does not make sense. If A plus B equals C, why doesn't it do that this time? You know, we don't want it to be our way so much as maybe consistent. And sometimes these free radicals, especially what we've seen lately in, in the society and in the media, there are horrible things happening where people are losing their loved ones. And it's, it's a theme. And again, it's, it's, it's that unfairness, the unfairness of this poem conveys about life and how even when we seem to be getting a second chance, it see, still gets you know ripped away from us in the end. But there's the word that keeps being repeated here impatience. He's impatient. He's impatient. It's mentioned at least four times throughout the entire poem where he is impatient, but Eurydice is not. Eurydice is, is, is dead. She is free of the trappings of time, what names are. She doesn't even remember, even though it says in the poem, she's new to death. She wears it as if it's fresh. She doesn't know Orpheus anymore. It's, just, it's, the, it's the freedom that we associate with death. That there's, it's free of cares, free of free of the, the burdens of, of fear or of love because she doesn't fear anything and how she is free of impatience, that she doesn't suffer from the same ailment that Orpheus has that on one hand has really helped him in getting, I mean, imagine going, you know, that takes some, that takes some gumption to take your guitar and sing your way into hell, you know, and then get all the way there, cajole the devil as it were, to let you have your gal back. And then, of course, that last little hitch, because no one tangles with the gods and comes away without a scar. And you can, again, equate that to life, whether it's going into hell physically in this case, or as many of us have emotionally, intellectually, that you come out and don't abandon all of your innocence. You don't lose all of yourself. But that tragedy, when you thicken your shield and when you, when you learn to walk upright after being beat down, you're not the same person you were. And that's really what leave, they leave Orpheus feeling in the end is if you can imagine the brokenness, um, especially once they talk about or Rilke writes about in an entire one of the probably to me, the most important and by far the most beautiful of all the stanzas within this entire poem is where they talk about Eurydice, how much she's loved, how much Orpheus hurts to have her gone. That not only does the pain engulf him, not only does it, does it engulf his every day, it has actually sprung out of him or feels as, it, as if it has in its own planet, with its own sun, with its own universe, with the disfigured stars. You know, it's, it's that, that, that we've all felt the pain, that infinite, that we, we swear that if we let it off its, its, off its leash, it would devour the world. And I'll read it again. The stanza about Eurydice and that Rilke writes, a woman so loved that from one liar there came more lament than from all lamenting women. 
that a whole world of lament arose in which all nature reappeared, forest and valley, road and village, field and stream and animal. And that around this lament world, even as around the other earth, a sun revolved and a silent star filled heaven, a lament heaven with its own disfigured stars. So greatly she was loved. And it's that you, I mean, you can imagine again, someone that we've all had in our life if once, if not several times in the fact that we feel it for our, our family and our family members, those who are linchpins, those who saved us and drug us along through life. If you're ever lucky to find that one in, in, in life that, uh, for some explicable reason, really, really digs you and wants to put up with your crazy poet self. You know, you 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 adore that, and you 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 can't imagine life without it. And it's what this is a poem that kind of pushes you into that uncomfortable place that you can't not, you can't avoid it, you can't, you have to stand up and see that fear because it's in such stark language. And especially as a poet, those who have, have leaned more towards the expressiveness on the page, which again is in a musical quality that almost hums like a blues song. Um, never making even though we hear about him how impatient orpheus is we don't see him throw temper tantrums we don't see him curse or loses lose his cool we just know he's impatient and we can understand his impatience to have him be cool calm and collected in a moment like this where you're standing in hell getting your girlfriend back to take back to the you know the world of the living i would imagine that's a little stressful and real okay again i I'm, i can't believe as much as some authors say that they they will write something so convincing that is just something they were curious about you know, or they, they write about an emotion or uh, or there's a myth like this one that's so important to them. That's that's just a, a causality of a of a of a whim. No, it just, I, it's not a personal thing of mine. It's just that you can't make it convincing unless you, until you inject some of yourself into it. And real I think, is laid out here. He was a very withdrawn gentleman, uh, very, um, very brooding, but not in, not in a negative way. He really was able to enunciate and was really in his lifetime um, respected. He kind of broke the mold in that way, as far as what we think of as a as a as a struggling artist or a starving poet. Um, he definitely had his times, but he he was one of those who said um, something to the effect of, "If you're a bad poet, blame yourself. Don't blame the public. Don't blame don't you know don't don't blame the um the, those who the haters and those that don't like you. If you're not making it in poetry, look deeper into poetry to find yourself. And if you're not there, maybe this isn't your bag. Right. And and it and it's it's a it's a sentiment that that really rings true in any vocation. If you were in medical school for 27 years and I was like, Luke, man, what's up? Well, I'm still in, in, in medical school. Ain't it been about 27 years? Yeah. We all say, man, maybe doctor ain't your thing. But in the arts, again, it's, it's something that it's, it's a hard thing to walk up against. And again, I'm not one saying that I'm the, I'm the judge, but it's something that you need as a poet or the artist, um, landscape or doctor, what have you, that you look at that. It's why am I doing it? Am I true to it? And real demanded that. And he gives us examples like this where he is so beautifully descriptive. And you would think of it today, especially even now, when you look at a poem that's roughly three pages long or exactly three pages long, you would think that would start to drag. But there again, what helps it along is if you're teaching it or if you're appreciating it, read it out loud, play with emphasis and, and stress, and you'll hear that embedded musical quality in the poem. It's, it's, just typically missed when I talk about the musical quality of poetry because so much of, of, of our society reads in here. You know, we don't really hear it out loud. When poetry was, and I'm not trying to go back to some gilded age, it was written, well, originally before we even, it was an oral tradition. We learned that when something's musical and rhymes, we will remember it. Well, the same thing again, once you read it, it was meant for people to come out and hear it. And over the decades, over the you know, century or so, it's been beaten into a corner. And it's either spoken word, which is awful poetry, screamed at you, or it's, um, it, it's, it's reading like a speaking spell. And it, it, no matter how beautiful it is, it disengages. So the reading of it is important when you want to get to, the, to get to the soul of a piece of poetry. Because as you do that, again, you kind of get brought into a play type feel, a soliloquy type feel. Now your neighbors or your, 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 those in the household might think you're crazy, but um, take it down that, you know, to them and perform it really. Because that's what it's about, especially if you want to take up poetry as, um, as something closer to a vocation is the delivery of the material. And so many of the, 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 the rhyme techniques, and, and this one, Real K really kind of tightened his language. And if you look through, you'll find a handful of polysyllabic words, but he really kind of sticks to very small, simple, very direct words, very monosyllabic sounds. And it almost mimics like a slow walking out, clip, 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 clip. And it, honestly makes it 
easier to read. There have been, I think there's one spot that I always get tripped up when I read it aloud are disfigured stars. But what that does for me, again, and when you read it out loud, you pay attention much closer to what the language says and how it comes across, how it sounds. What was Rilke trying to get across when he created this music within the poem? And in this case, it's, it's a fantastic story. It's one that's universal. It's one that, that, that there have been several other poets and maybe the next one I can find, I'll bring a list of those who have taken this. It's, it's, it's really something that's been a bloodline through them all. But the themes, the, the idea of the poem that, that unfair things happen, that we struggle to understand it, that it's taken to almost a dreamscape by mid-break where, it, you know, Orpheus says, you know, I, I hurt her so much that I, I hurt to, missing her so much. I, I hurt in that loss of her love so much that that pain has now reached out and created its own universe. So insufferable it is that, and again, the break where we would all love and say and would love to believe that we would go into hell for that person we love to bring him out. But in that doing, the more desperate act, the more, um, the farther we go, maybe not in a positive way. Maybe it's not. Na and again, the whole idea of the natural world and going in and bringing something back from the dead. If you go back hundreds of years, there's rarely a time that coming back from the dead works out well from anybody. And so there again, he's doing a very unnatural act, going to a much more desperate end to bring her out. And even though it seems like a second chance, there's a balance to the universe. When he gets almost to the door and turns around, you get that image of Mercury or Hermes saying that agony on his face saying you were so close. You were so close. You were right there. And again, not mocking like we're used to in these stories, but just hating it for him, you know, and as heartbroken as it is, the almost kick to the groin in this whole poem is that Orpheus is at the top looking back and she just looks up and says, who is that? What, I don't, I don't She doesn't remember being there. So to be Orpheus, looking back into the pit to see not only is she leaving, but that it doesn't seem to bother her because it doesn't. Some things happen and need to be left behind for a reason and trying to drudge them up, the more desperate, again, kind of what we're seeing here in these day, days and times, the more desperate of an end that you're trying to attain with this sometimes comes back with the most negative of results. It's about understanding yourself. It's about balance. It's about, it's about reflection. It's about letting go. And it's never easy. It's never going to be easy for me or for anybody. And that's what makes or yeah, I, I just had a, a question that I wanted, that I wanted to interject interject and I don't and know, I don't know if this is the rules for, for understanding understand how to communicate, how to communicate with the but I'm kind of curious if there like what events were occurring in Roko's life that perhaps motivated this this poem like who is he who do you see him him as in this in this poem or it or or is he um does he have some distance? I mean, is he not, I, I can't imagine he wouldn't be invested in all the characters. How do you see what's going on in his personal life playing out within the poem? With Rilke, I believe in this period, or in this poem rather, um, I see him as Orpheus. However, I find it extremely interesting. And I, again, I don't mean to be harping on it, but with, with Hermes, with Mercury's uh, emotional attachment and the fact that you don't always hear in all the stories, and some of the tellings of it is just the two of them, Orpheus and Eurydice walking out, that you have Mercury or Hermes in this case beside her as a chaperone. And the fact that it, the real K intentionally gives the gods not an all around pervasive, convincing, negative, maniacal air, but that one of them, you know, one of them, one of the gods, one of those that are better than men did feel and hurt for man. It's one of the only times that you really see that you see the gods take pity. You know, you see them do, do favors for mankind um, out of pity. Uh, but to see a genuine human feeling like sorrow because he can't take pity on them. He can't change the outcome. It makes me think that Rilke was going through something in life where there was someone there helping him. There was somebody, not, not, not so much an angel, but maybe somebody in his life. He was not very lucky with love. Um, he had some patrons and he, he had no problem associating with women and he wasn't by any means a, a womanizer trying to fulfill that stereotype either. But it's the whole idea and how pervasive, again, the whole stanza that I go back to where he talks about how much he hurt over the loss of Eurydice. 
the things that a poet picks out of the story where he to him it, it was also about the, the walk out you didn't get that whole half that makes you need to go back and read the story from beginning to end from you know one of the a textbook or whatnot but it, it starts on the walk back out to the surface where it's, again it's midway through someone's life many think of it as walking towards death or being lost in a dark wood like dante but maybe halfway through life you're trying to walk back towards or towards something that you're achieving and wanting to bring something from the past along with you. And as we know through friendships and, and, and romantic relationships, that sometimes the past doesn't fit smoothly into the present or even the future. And so to me, it, was, it always felt like Real K was trying to pull parts of his life together with someone there, whether it was a mentor or somebody that he, it doesn't seem the same kind of love as, as that would be um, between in a, a more love-based romantic nature, but something of like a guide, kind of like a Virgil to Dante. And so for me, I mean, again, I can just, it's a very painful poem, but it doesn't leave Orpheus broken at the end. It just, it, it, it also it means that, you know, whoever that Eurydice character was to Real K, who was walking back free of him, not impatient, not hurt, not aware, letting someone go free. It's a very, I love that question because again, it's, it's what kind of haunts me. And I've looked and tried to find a parallel and I can't, but it's just the way he tells it sticks with me and the way that, what he picks as the, up as the details that that hurts to really specify the agony it has to come from a wellspring of yourself and the fact that again it, it wasn't set in that orpheus was broken and didn't live another day it really kind of leaves you with the idea and the 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 expression of, of orpheus brokenhearted and reaching down but you're left with eurydice free now again we think about death has been in hades and not hell in, in the old way not the new but that, you know, maybe somebody in, in Real K's life that was painful to let go, he had to finally lose. And that's that, that's the kind of the only parallel I can draw in. Well, I think it was really fantastic. I, I, I have to say this is one of the most enjoyable um, intellectual creations that I've had the opportunity to be a part of. And I really want to thank you for breaking down this poem. And I truthfully hope that you do a lot more of this. I think what you are doing for poetry through your own book, which we should say something about, The Draw of Broken Eyes and Whirling Metaphysics, is something I can recommend and everyone should pick up. But I think um, the care that you have for the written word and for the articulation of it is really unparalleled. And I, I guess what I'm saying is I hope you um, continue to come back to the Noetic platform and, and teach thousands of people about this love for poetry because I think our society sorely needs it. Man, I'd be honored to. I love all the work I do with you, brother. So you let yeah. me know and we'll hook it up. Yeah, I, I was. it was a very moving recitation and a very moving explication. I can't wait to share it with other people. Um, I, I, You and I can talk forever. I'm sure we've been going for a little bit. Is there <laughs> anything you'd like to say in, in closing before we end the broadcast? No, I'm a, a huge fan and of Noetics, and I hope that what we're doing can further that because, again, you can change the world, teach it. Yeah, I, I think it's. I think it's. I think we have a, a chance to, um, bit by bit, affect the culture positively. All right. Thank you, Cliff. Uh, thank you for listening, everyone. Uh, download the Noetic app. You can find poetry uh, lessons and philosophy lessons there. Um, and it's my intention to stick with this project for a long time and open it up to the other humanities as well um, when the resources are available. So stay tuned. All right. See you guys.